gods. You know, all kinds of living entities are attracted to Krishna because Krishna has all attractive qualities. Huh? Everyone is attracted to something, to some particular set of qualities. And so those qualities are coming from Krishna. Whatever qualities that we're attracted to, they're present in Krishna or in one of Krishna's other forms, other than the Govinda form. So my uh, particular attraction, although I'm very attracted to Krishna, is Lord Nishingha, and in particular his childhood pastimes, which are not discussed in the scriptures. But just because they're not discussed in the scriptures doesn't mean they don't exist. Yeah? Maybe there's no room in the scriptures for them, or maybe they're too confidential, more likely than they're too confidential. So we don't read about Lord uh, Kurma's childhood pastimes or uh, Lord Bor, huh? and we don't read about much about Vamana. What did he do after he visited Bali Maharaj? Huh? There's so many gaps in the stories of the different incarnations, pastimes, but that doesn't mean that they're not there. It doesn't mean they're not doing anything. Huh? It means that the most important activities are given in the scriptures as far as our present stage of spiritual development. And then the other activities are there, um, but they're to be realized by those uh, whose devotional service requires that realization, and not by others. Here's a good example. Radha and Krishna's marriage. There are certain scriptures where you can read about the marriage of Radha and Krishna. <laughs> Florian is frowning at me like, hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, the, it's bogus, right? Yeah. And, and the reason it's there is that certain people were claiming that Krishna is immoral because he's dancing with other men's wives in the forest in the middle of the night. And who, who knows what else they're doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, this is actually not anybody's business, what they're doing in the forest at night. Except those devotees whose service requires them to know. Huh? It's just like, I used to be married. So if I was at work and somebody uh, started asking me all kinds of questions about my relationship with my wife, I would think, oh boy, this is not in very good taste, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, if they persisted, it would be like, well, you know, come on out in the parking lot, let's talk about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm from New Jersey, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> If uh, someone who uh, doesn't have any business starts inquiring about some intimate relationship, that's offensive. We have this concept even in material relationships. So what to speak of spiritual relationships, which are even more personal, more confidential, uh, more special. So unless a person has a need to know about a particular pastime, then generally it's not described in the scriptures. And that's all right. It doesn't mean that pastime doesn't exist. Every incarnation of Godhead has childhood pastimes. Because every incarnation has a mother and a father. Huh? They don't just like drop out of the sky. Huh? They, they appear through a mother and father. Why? Because they enjoy the service given by the mother and father. They enjoy the childhood pastimes like that. So why should Lord Nishinga Day be any different? Anyway, uh, I'm not going to try to... Uh, to defend 
my realizations because after all, they're my realizations. <laughs> and the other thing is, if by having these realizations that aren't in the scriptures, a devotee manifests all the symptoms of love of Godhead, including detachment, complete engagement in devotional service, uh, the ability to convince others of spiritual truths, and so on and so forth, then why shouldn't that be accepted? Because actually my personal realization of Krishna is nobody's business anyway. Huh? Just like I don't, you know, I don't write to people or, or talk to people and say, and uh, exactly how have you realized Krishna? It's, an, it's not polite. You know? Uh, because you're prying into some confidential relationship. If their relationship is bogus, then you'll know by their symptoms. For example, the Sahajyas in India. You know, they say, oh, we're Krishna's wives, and they dress up in saris, oh, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, carry the jars on your head. <laughs> Siddhanta told him what he thinks about it. Yeah, well, they're bogus. They're bogus. <laughs> so, if someone's realization is really bogus, then you'll know by their symptoms they won't be able to follow the principles. They'll start talking about some really weird philosophy, uh, some speculative philosophy. But uh, we don't do that. We, we speak strictly from Scripture, and we teach all the standard devotional principles and we also follow them ourselves. So, there shouldn't be a problem. Other question? Mm, yeah. The business just left. Huh? It's not just left. No, we think Well, yeah, maybe. So, yeah, there was a dialogue between Peter and Neville, and maybe with that out, then you can comment on that because it contains questions. But it's good to see the progression. Mm -hmm. So, um, Peter asked, our soul is all pervasive, so we should be able to project ourselves in many different places at once. So the Neville said, well, uh, in the Bhagavad Gita verse proper about the all pervasiveness of the soul, Prabhupada writes, the word Sarvagataha what the reigning is significant because there is no doubt that the living entities are all over God's creation. They live on the land, in the water, in the air, within the earth, and even within fire. So then said Peter, but I thought our soul was not in our body, but far away from matter. And there was some silence, and then uh, it continued with, or oh, maybe it's all the Chintya Veda Veda Tatra. And then the question, then Neville said, well, um, the, another related question. There is a danger of invoking a Chintya Veda Tattva to hide behind when we can't properly understand something. So where is that inconceivably, inconceiv inconceivability applicable? That is uh, the question of, of Neville as the sum total of the... When is the inconceivableness of being simultaneously one and different? Uh -huh. When is that applicable? No, when it is applicable to refer to that to that tattva, to that truth, to say, oh, we don't, we can't discuss about this because it's inconceivable anyway. Because because when Peter nothing, says nothing, nothing is inconceivable uh, if you have spiritual intelligence. Um, it's easy to understand that the similarity between the soul and the supreme is qualitative and the difference is quantitative. Okay, So the sarvagata, uh, all-pervading nature of the soul, is, as Prabhupada described it, because there are living entities everywhere. But there's another aspect of that all-pervading nature, which is that the soul can go anywhere, can travel anywhere. Uh, in the free soul, the liberated soul, can travel anywhere simply by wanting to be there. Uh, and we have this ability in conditioned consciousness to 
to a very limited extent uh, by imagination or by recollection. Uh, we can recall being somewhere, doing something. Uh, many people have uh, very strong recollections of their childhood, for example, the place where they grew up, the, uh, the sound of their parents' voice, especially their mother. Uh, these are very strong recollections. And by thinking about them, it's almost as if you're there. It's almost as if you're re-experiencing the same uh, place and time all over again. And, and why not? Because the soul, being transcendental, is beyond time and space, uh, constitutionally. But, again, the difference is in quantity. It's quantitative. I may be able to 